Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to worship at Woodlawn. <sighs> it's been a heck of a week. Um, I think the thing I wanted to let you know about is session is discussing, and we're trying to uh, come to an agreement about when it's, when it's safe and when it's possible to come back and meet at the church. So we have had um, one meeting uh, last Sunday, and we're going to meet again in two weeks. And now session is supposed to be calling each and every one of you looking for input because we want to make it safe. But it's been a long time. And the other thing I need, I need to let you know about is just, if you would, send condolences to Deborah Good and, and Mark. Um, they, Deborah's brother passed away last week. So please be in prayer for them and your whole church family that we can get together again, that we can worship together again, and that um, hopefully this coronavirus would be defeated. Um, the, there is one thing to let you know. You won't be able to sit in your normal pews. I can tell you that right off of Jump Street. We're going to be social distancing and, and asking that you use your best judgment uh, as far as masks go. And um, if you are high risk, I'm going, to be, I'm going to keep doing these video services for a while until there's either a cure or a vaccine. So uh, it will always be available. The service will always be available on video. Just probably won't be as much fun. So let's get started for, to worship. Let's get started to love the Lord. The uh, thought for the day is that the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and untried. That's from G.K. Chesterton back in the 1800s. So let's, okay, people, let's sit up. Let's put your feet flat on the floor. Let's concentrate on a wonderful, wonderful God. Hear the call to worship. God remembers and visits us and restores us to the community of faith. In our pain, suffering, and loss, we know the assurance of God's presence. When we have opposition and hopeless situations, God bears us up on eagle's wings. In the loneliness of our firm idealism, God grants healing, God grants transformation. So whatever we need as we gather to worship, however we gather to worship, a merciful and loving God meets us where we are. We assemble with high expectations that God has much good in store for us, and the good gifts God bestows on us are for our use in reaching out to others. We want to use our talents in the service of Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's listen to the mini choir sing, Take My Life and Let It Be.
And now, hear our invocation. Where charity and love are, God is there. Christ's love has gathered us into one. Let us rejoice and be pleased in him. Let us fear and let us love the living God. And may we love each other with a sincere heart. Where charity and love are, God is there. We are gathered into one body. Beware lest we be divided in mind. Let evil impulses stop. Let controversy cease. And may Christ our God be in our midst. Where charity and love are, God is there. And may we, with the saints also, see thy face in glory, O Christ our God. The joy is immense and good unto the ages, through the infinite ages. Amen. And our scripture today, we're going to start at the very beginning. We're going to start in the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God saw that the light was good. And we will keep going. We'll go to Psalm 8, one of my favorites. The psalmist says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens through the praise of children and infants. You have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands, and you put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and animals of the world, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea that swim in the paths of the sea, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And finally, we go to the book of Matthew. And we're going to read Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. That's at the end of the book of Matthew and probably some of the most meaningful passages in the whole book. Here now, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always till the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. These few sentences that I've read you from the book of Matthew is known as the Great Commission. It's the part where Jesus, after he was resurrected, encouraged his followers and gave them a job description. Now, in my research, I found a breakdown of this great commission, and I think it may lead to some greater understanding, greater comprehension, and greater love for what we as Christians are called on to do in our daily lives. What if we took the great commission as our job description? How do you think we're doing? both as a church and as individuals, this is not only written to that amorphous big thing called the church. This job description is for each and every one of us. And when we take the words off the page of the Bible and listen to them, think about them, take them into ourselves, we can take direction from them as the first disciples did. Therefore, go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 
and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded to you. So what if we looked at those words as a template on how to assess how on purpose this church is? What might Jesus be wanting to empower within our people? We can take each piece of the commission, explain it to people, and lead them with reflective thoughts and turn, turn these for mission statements into formation questions. So let's look at a few of these words. He starts out, go therefore. Now the Greek is not compl complex here. It's an imperative verb subject to a causative conjunction. Everybody knows that. Jesus has authority. He translates it into power for his followers. The result is going. Authority breeding action. Can we point to specific places in our life where our faith was put into action? When was the last time our faith made us uncomfortable as we acted on it? You know, our faith should make us both comfortable and uncomfortable. Then he says, go make disciples. We are to be ever in the pursuit of directing people towards Christ. So we ask ourselves, how are our spouses more like Jesus because of us? How are our children more like Jesus because of us? How is our extended family, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, the Starbucks barista more like Christ because of us? Exploring those questions ought to create more intention in our churches than weeks of sermons would. Now go to all nations. Jesus had little room for Judea centricity. He has little room for American centricity. Our budgets, our prayers, and our perspective should reflect the reality that we are the privileged. Now, you go to church on Sunday, you got to drive by 10 other churches before getting to this one, and all nations don't experience this. And Jesus' purpose is to extend the gospel to every tribe, language, people, and nation. Are our, per are our people allowing this purpose to drive their lives, to drive our lives? Baptizing them. Now, while the act of baptism is typically a clergy function, explore the meaning behind baptism. Dip, sprinkled, adults or infants, baptism communicates belonging. And a tangible piece of that theology is extending belonging and welcome to within our worship settings. No program can make a church warm and welcoming to the unconnected. Only people can. How are our people making this church a community, not an event? Can we tell people about our church even though we're not in the sanctuary? Can we make the world a better place from our own homes? Can we connect with people simply by telling them about our experiences here at Woodlawn? Now, interesting. It says, and teaching them. Now, we don't think of ourselves as teachers. But let's not allow ourselves to be removed from teaching the faith to others. If one's spiritual gifts don't include mercy and giving, they aren't excused from these aspects of discipleship, and the same holds true for teaching. One doesn't need to know everything to teach, only something that the TG doesn't know. Christianity, our faith, is an inherited faith passed on from one generation to the next. And let's encourage people. Let's encourage people to find a Timothy to be Paul to. So exhort the older to mentor the younger. Exhort the younger to develop the youth. Exhort the youth to teach the children. I know we don't have younger people here. And that's a problem. But you have younger people in your families. You have... Others, you have all, you know a lot of people, face it. And a lot of those people in this day and age don't know Christ. Be a Paul to their Timothy.
We can do it as we talk with folks on the phone, even on the computer, to our immediate family. We know that people can learn no matter what. We can use our time to think about how we might teach others. It's not quite as easy as you think, though, is it? These words of Jesus give, them some, give us some pause, and rightly so. We can't take them frivolously. We can't ignore them. We can't forget them. Taking them seriously means each one of us has to consider how we're doing. What kind of a church are we? Are we the one that takes the Great Commission seriously? Do we ignore it? Or kind of are we somewhere in the middle? What do you think? To help you in consideration, first consider what kind of church are we? A bib church or an apron church? There's a church somewhere that teaches we want our members to wear aprons, not bibs. Then they provide the explanation. Bibs are only for people who want to be fed. Bibs are for those who are not yet ready or willing to feed themselves. Bibs are for those who are more interested in being served than serving. Bibs are for those who insist that the church exists for them and their friends. Bibs are for babes in the faith, those who haven't caught God's vision for the church or those who have, are not yet of that faith. Now, aprons. Aprons are for those who have a heart to serve others in Jesus' name. Aprons are for those who know that they are the church. Aprons are for those who don't mind getting their hands dirty. Aprons are for those who take time daily to feed their spiritual hunger. Aprons are for those who are growing in their faith and hungry to help others grow. Now you might say, well, only babies wear bibs, and in fact, baby, babies couldn't wear aprons even if they wanted to. Bingo! The Apostle Paul on more than one occasion laments the fact that his people are like, still like infants. So this illustration asks the question, what are you wearing? A bib or an apron? A Christian is someone who is wearing either the one or the other. So what's it going to be? As we all continue on our spiritual journey, it's not the first time we'll be asked a question, and it won't be the last. This business of being the church does not end with the building on Sunday morning, doesn't end in a Bible study or a breakfast. It doesn't end with anything until each and every person has the opportunity to find out about Jesus Christ. It may be too big a job for one person or one church, but the disciples took that charge seriously. We know the adventures of Paul and Peter around the Mediterranean. We think that Thomas went to India, Andrew to the Greek Isles, and perhaps James went all the way to Spain. But you say, I can't go to all those faraway places. I have a family and responsibilities right here. That's good reason. But you can do the Great Commission right here. When the COVID-19 threat is lessened, you will see more people each and every day. Maybe some of them know you're a follower of Jesus, but the way to let others know that you follow Christ is simply to act like it. When people look at you, see the way that you act and the way that you treat others, are you telling them, that you're a follower of Christ? We express our beliefs in how we choose to live our lives. We express our beliefs in how we choose to live our lives, and it's that simple. You know, perhaps one of the worst things that this country has done since its inception is to believe that everybody's faith is their own business. We're seeing how that plays out. People without a background or training in faith simply don't have any faith. They live their lives like they themselves are in charge and responsible to nobody but themselves. It's a great idea, or is it? 
When we go through our normal day, most of us don't think a lot about our faith. We kind of tend to ignore it. Ah, oh, man, we know it's there, but we don't make a big deal out of it. But when life's big things hits us, it's an anchor that holds our ship where we want it to be. And as I accompany you, as I accompany you all on this life journey thing, I can't count the times folks have said to me, I don't know how I could have gotten through this without faith. And if you don't know how you would have gotten through, how can others get through? How can people face life's challenges on their own? If we are to love one another as we love ourselves, how can you keep your faith to yourself? Good question, isn't it? How can you keep your faith to yourself? We should be changed by our faith. We should be different because of our faith. So here's the question of today, and it's one I've asked folks in the past, and one I think I've mentioned from the pulpit. Let's clear our minds. Let's answer the question in our minds and in our hearts. Ready? What is Christ calling you to do? How does Christ change your life? Now, you can feel free to blow the question off. You can feel free to, ah, maybe you'll think about it tomorrow. Or you can decide that I am impinging on your religious freedom and intruding on your life. You can give the easy answer of Christ wants me to be myself. So take a second. Let us pass some time in thought and prayer. And we'll do this at the end of the sermon. What is Christ calling you to do? What is he calling you to change? Who is he calling you to help? How is Christ asking you to get outside of the walls and change your town, change your county, change your state, and change the world? Is everything around you here perfect? How can we love more, give more, and change more? Now remember that in our scripture it says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. The first word is go. So while I've got your attention here and, and quiet, let's each one of us answer that question. And remember, the only answer that's not acceptable is I don't know. If that's all you come up with, then I suggest that you take some more time, maybe even a bit of prayer. What is Christ calling you to do? Let's be silent for a minute. If you don't have an answer, if you, if you give the I don't know answer, if you give the I'm doing everything Christ is calling me to do, then during this week, spend a little time in prayer, Spend a little time with God and really ask the question, what is Christ calling me to do? Amen. So, we go right from here to one of my favorite things, communion. And let's look around your house Find something to eat and drink. Now, it would be good if it was grape juice, wine, and bread. But as we've said in the last months, anything you have will do. As long as we eat and drink in remembrance of Christ, our hearts will feel it, and Christ will know it. So take a minute, find something in the kitchen, and don't you worry. I'll wait. I'm going to go down to the kitchen myself. So now that you found something, let's hear our choir sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
now, just kind of listen. Listen to a statement of faith. We belong to God, eternal and infinite, creator of all things that is and is yet to come. We follow Christ, who comes to us from God and reveals God to us. He heals people and transforms lives. He calls us to join in his ministry. He was crucified, died, and was raised again by God and reigns over all creation and bids us to die and rise with him in the service of healing the world. We are moved by the Holy Spirit together with the community of saints as members of the body of Christ, God's holy and universal church. We are confident in the forgiveness of sin, the power of the resurrection, and in the reality of eternal life. In all things, it is our desire to follow Christ by the grace of the Holy Spirit for God's glory. Amen. Now, I have found one of these nifty individual communion cups, which we'll probably be using when we get back. So let us take now and remember that on the night, on that Passover night, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in his name, I give you the bread, or I give you whatever you've been able to find. And take and eat now, knowing that this is God's gift to you. And when the meal was concluded, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, as a sign of the new covenant, I give you the cup. And this cup is a gift of Christ. This cup is for you alone. So take and drink whatever you are able to find. And let us now thank God. Lord, you have given us these gifts, whatever they are. You have given it to us. You allow us to remember you. You allow us to feel your presence. You allow us to feel your power. You allow us to feel your hope. You allow us to feel your love. Lord, by this communion meal, let us go out into the world and show the world who we are. We are followers of yours. In Christ's name, amen. And now, oh, let's see here. Let us pray. And let's pray for the good family. Let us pray for the Brown family. Let us pray for those who need Christ's, Christ's help and healing the most. Let us pray. Lord, be with us as we travel this path of life. It's not always easy, it's not always fun, but it is the path that you have given us. So Lord, we lift up the good family, we lift up the Brown family, we lift up all those who need you. And Lord, let us be, let us be your hands and feet on this earth. Let us not be afraid or ashamed to tell people about you. Give each and every person strength and hope. Give them all the gifts that they need for traveling this road. And Lord, we know you will because that's what you do. And Lord, we give you thanks and we give you thanks in the way that Jesus taught us saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us also keep in prayer the upheaval in this country, the direction this country is going to to choose to go. Let us pray that there are wise enough heads to follow Christ, to follow God, and to do what is right. This is not an easy time to be in this country. And Lord, may you just lead each and every person in power and not. In Christ's name, amen. And now, let's hear the choir sing Blessed Assurance. Go forth. Go forth into a divided world and help it to heal. Go forth into a troubling world. And as the Spirit hovered over the waters, may you be a calming influence on this world. This world is our world. We were given dominion over it. Let us be healers of the world, not haters. In Christ's name, amen. Go forth.